Welcome to Press Play, the Street Cred podcast with Elena Krasdow, yours truly, and Jimmy Moak from Street Cred PR. In this podcast, Jimmy and I will welcome industry leaders, journalists, influencers, and friends of the firm to shed some light on who they are and the various twists and turns that led them to where they are today. We're grateful to have you listening in, and we hope you enjoy the show. My name is Elena Kratznow. Welcome to Press Play, the Street Cred Podcast. I'm so grateful you're here. I'm the editorial manager and client brand evangelist at Street Cred PR and your host for today's show, along with co-host and managing partner, Jimmy Moak. We will break down the show into two segments, Press, where we dive into all the hard news about our guest's life and their professional goals, and then Play, where we have a little extra fun with it. Today, we are honored to be joined by legendary financial journalist, author, and founder, Paul Sullivan. Paul is the founder of The Company of Dads, the first platform dedicated to creating a community for lead dads. Its mission is to help lead dads feel less isolated and more confident that they have made the correct choice to take on the bulk of the parenting and family duties, or at the very least, not embrace stereotypes around who does what at home. If you're wondering what a lead dad is, if you're not, we will get into all that here shortly. Before becoming a founder, Paul wrote the Wealth Matters column in the New York Times for 13 years and also was the mastermind behind the Money Game column in Golf Magazine. As a journalist for 25 years, Paul got his start as a reporter at Bloomberg and Institutional Investor. From 2000 to 2006, he was a reporter, editor, and columnist at the Financial Times, and has also written for publications like Fortune, Money, Condé Nast Portfolio, the International Herald Tribune, Barron's, the Boston Globe, and Food & Wine. Paul is the author of two books, Clutch, Why Some People Excel Under Pressure and Others Don't, and The Thin Green Line, The Money Secrets of the Super Wealthy. He has been interviewed on podcasts, radio, and television programs across America, including NPR Marketplace, CNN, Fox News, and has given keynote talks to audiences from 50 to 500 people in the United States, Mexico, and Chile. Today, he lives in Connecticut with his wife and their three daughters and three dogs. When he is not running the company of dads, he is an obsessive golfer. Paul, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show. Wow. I don't know if I can live up to that that intro, but thank you, Elena, for having me on. Thank you, Jimmy, too. It's all facts, according to Google. <laughs> so is. you're already living whatever, it. Whatever the Google says is true. So. Exactly. We abide by that full heartedly. <laughs> and we love that the bio is that long so that there's less content for us to go through during the actual show. Now, now right. I have to get really short answers. Is that what you need now, Jimmy? <laughs> you have three words for each question. <laughs> We're just looking for top line messaging here. <laughs> but before we get into all of that, me and Jimmy always like to kick off with a very important question, which is, what did you have for lunch today, Paul? Oh, my goodness. So uh, I went out to lunch uh, in my town. You have people, a lot of people uh, working from home on Friday and... I was all set. I'll be honest. I was all set to have uh, the hot, hot summer Friday. I was all set to have sort of like a margarita and a cheeseburger. And the person across from me, he went first and he said, uh, I'll have an iced tea. So I was like, okay, I'll I'll have an iced tea too. (laughs) And then he went second and he said, uh, you know, and the entree says, well, you know, I think I'm going to get a chopped salad. And I was totally crestfallen because, you know, take me, he was hosting me. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll get the the crispy chicken salad. And just as the server was about to leave, I said, "Can you please throw in the guacamole with some chips? Because I had to get something fun." So, so that was my lunch, and it was delicious. It was healthy, and maybe I got the cheeseburger tonight for dinner. Love that. I always have to throw in something fun if I'm not getting like a cool carb in there. What am I even doing? <laughs> yeah, it's like right now. It's like 95 degrees out. It's like this is margarita time. Come on, or iced tea. Chop salad time, apparently. Chop salad time. Yeah. <laughs> so a follow up to that business lunches or just friendly lunches. When whenever I go to a bar for lunch, I love to sit at the bar, whether I'm having a salad or the burger, but I never, ever order a beer or a drink. I'm always the iced tea guy. Mm. And I think that's just I mean, obviously, this is me trying to be a responsible worker and an employer. But also, if I have a beer or a drink midday, forget it. I'm not going back to work. How do you balance that act? So I, I've learned from past mistakes, and I, and, I, and I talk a good game. So if this wasn't a Friday, I would not be ordering a cocktail. But when I was at the Financial Times, I had an amazing run there for, for six years. And across the street was this restaurant called Il Gato Pardo. 
and I did a whole bunch of things at um, uh, at the FT. But one of them was I created uh, a wealth column. Um, Robert Frank had created a wealth column at the Wall Street Journal. I created sort of the second one at at the FT. And so that led to all kinds of lunches, uh, fancy lunches with people who would be sources. You couldn't really, you know, take them to Chick Fil A. I mean, this was the wealth column. You had to take them to this fancy restaurant. And I would go, and probably three days a week, and I would get you know some sort of appetizer, uh, some sort of entree and a glass of wine and a couple months in, and and i would get tired afterwards i get really tired afterwards and i get back to the office and have like an hour and then i have to run down to the starbucks and get a giant coffee but i was in my you know early 30s so i i, I could swing it um <laughs> and at one point the office manager came to me and said uh paul every day you're it's like 135 dollars or 140 which is this is you know 15 years ago and I said, yeah, yeah, it is. You know, don't you think that's a lot? It's like, you know, Rivka, I write the wealth column. Uh, I can't be expected to take people to Chick-fil-A. And, and if they order a glass of wine, what am I going to do? You know, order an iced tea, make them feel like some sort of like, you know, midday alcoholic. I got to be there for them. This is, you know, you got to support them. They tell yeah. me more stuff. This is how you get more out of your sources too. hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Well, let's dive in. You've had one hell of a career as a journalist, Paul, working at some of the most prestigious publications around a few you've already mentioned. What was it like beginning your career at Bloomberg and how did that lead you to Financial Times and all the rest? Well, I'll tell you, so I got to Bloomberg in, in 99 and I moved to New York City at the end of 96, the beginning of 97. And my first job was actually an institutional investor in the newsletter division, which was quite famous back then. It was run by this guy named Tom Lamont, who was out of central casting and trained all kinds of, you know, you know, journalists that, that are household names. Now, you know, D David Faber on, on CNBC, he started off there and he did all these great times, but he was like, he smoked cheap cigars. He ate M&Ms. He would bribe you with candy. He would make you stay late. And it was... The strangest thing, and I, I did two or three tours there, and I kept leaving thinking I, th this can't be what I want to do. And I, I would go do different things, and I'd come back. And um, that, to me, it turned out to be the best, you know, training ground ever as a journalist. Because when you're 23, 24, um, I'd gone right from college to the University of Chicago, and and, and I thought I wanted to get a PhD, but I I didn't. And so I, everybody would ask you as a young journalist, like, you know, where'd you go to school? And I'd tell them. And I would say the University of Chicago, and I didn't say that I had, uh, you know, a, a master's degree in, in history. That wouldn't have got me anywhere. I just left it hang there. And they all thought I was, you know, an economic whiz. And that was kind of my entree. And, you know, the, the other thing I remember about that job is if I didn't ask enough questions, this guy Tom Lamont would make you call people back, which was horribly embarrassing and also really <laughs> difficult to get people um, on the phone a second time. Because, again, you're calling from this little newsletter. This is not the New York Times. It's not the FT. It's not Bloomberg. Um, and that was just the most amazing training ground. Because after that, I just kept people on the phone as long as I could and, and just asked them all kinds of questions. Awesome. Wow. And I mean, yeah, that's amazing. Um, we're also curious, you've been in journalism for so long. How have you seen it change over the course of your career? When I started at the FT in 2000, when you would get hate mail, people would actually write you uh, a letter. They would sit down and they'd write you a letter and they'd send it to you and then you'd read it. And if the letters editor approved it, it'd run in the you know letter section. And, and that's how it worked. And you only got two types of of letters. You got letters from crazy people and you got letters from high ranking government or corporate officials. Now, by the time I started at the, the Times, New York Times in 2008, there was a system by which you could click a button next to somebody's story and they would send you an email. And the rule back then was that you, you didn't have to reply, but they really wanted you to read the email. And, you know, when I started, I, I interviewed to write the Wealth Miles column and 2008, uh, the day Bear Stearns collapsed was my first interview. I was told uh, the day Lehman Brothers collapsed that I would be able to write the Wealth Matters column. And my first column ran shortly before Bernie Madoff was taken out of his Park Avenue apartment. So everything changed in that span. And so by the time 2009 rolled around and I was kind of getting up to speed writing this column, the emails I would get were awful. It was like, you know, uh, you're the stupidest person in Stupidville. How does somebody as stupid as you uh, live your stupid life as stupidly as you do? And they go on and on, on. And then they, you know, at one point somebody created a website um, because they really hated one of my columns. Uh, and at the time they, they were, I, I wore a bow tie, which I don't wear anymore. Don't hold that against me. Um, but I, they <laughs> hopefully not as a result of the website. <laughs> no, well, they're trying to figure out a way. Could you hang somebody uh, with a bow tie? And I thought that this was, 
uh, really clever. I didn't really take it seriously. And I showed my wife and she says, oh my goodness, we have to unlist our address. They're going to come and hang you. I was like, I don't really think they're going to come and hang me. I think they're just riffing. Um, but when you get those emails, every so often, one of them would be so awful that I would reply. And I'd reply and say, look, man, I know you don't like what I wrote, but you know, there's a human on the other end. And you know, 95% of the time, the person would then write back and apologize and say, mm. you know, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I just was venting. I didn't actually think anybody read these. And there's only one exception to that. There was a guy named Harris Lertzman. And I don't know if Harris Lertzman is still alive, but he worked for the New York State government and he would send these emails. And every one of them was really, you are so dumb. I can't believe how dumb you are. Why do you get to do this dumb job? And and I would just always reply to him because Harris was so, and, and I would say stuff like, Harris, please, it's a Saturday. My column always ran a Saturday, you know, read the sports section instead. I mean, there's a nice art section to ease into your day. Um, and what, changed is as we went along you know people stopped writing you know no more letters uh no more emails and then everything just took to social media and took to twitter and, and mm. then it just sort of disintegrated because you didn't really have um uh, a, a personal connection and and there's this guy on twitter uh who has taken it upon himself to find the typos in the new york times and he, he has a day job because i'm making a pay to find typos in the new york times um and he just doesn't understand like how much goes into producing that much copy every single day and there's no way there's not going to be a typo in there and there's probably a typo because 10 editors have have read it and their eyes have glazed over and they've missed this this obviously and he will now put stuff out uh on social media and i think he's an attorney i think that would get paid but i'm like why do you do that like what what like so i do the biggest thing for me that i miss is i miss that you know personal connection yeah the, um even even the even the angry readers because it just was you you could be one on one as opposed to somebody blasted out on social media and you know that's just yeah a suck, a sucker's game. And if there was if you're already having to remind people of your humanity when they're corresponding with you one on one in email or in letters, I imagine it's even more so the case with social media, which is even more depersonifying. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, the simple as an answer is yes. <laughs> a quick follow up to that. Talk a little bit about, uh, and we're going to talk about the PR journalism mm -hmm. dynamic a little bit later, but yeah. from when you started in, I think you said it was 96 or was it 99 yeah. at II? 96. Yeah, 96, 96. at II. Yeah, 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 Have you noticed, you know, obviously there's been a lot of changes in the world of publishing, whether it's a daily or magazine, you know, everything now is digital first and print is almost an, an afterthought for many outlets. I'm wondering how that changed the work of a reporter. And if you noticed any type of different changes between how someone like Elena or I would approach you yeah. over the years, is there any, any insights you could offer there? Well, a hundred percent. So in some ways the work of being a reporter has gotten easier because, you know, when I started at II, we had all kinds of like stacks of books. I can't even remember what they're called, but essentially you, you'd look up the company that you wanted to reach and the phone number would be there and it would, they, they, they publish them every six months and you'd have uh, the numbers of the 10 or 20, you know, key people. And like, you would have this, we had this document, this, you know, word document that was printed out that would essentially be passed from reporter to reporter if that reporter moved to a different beat or something like that you, you'd literally hand over your printed out you know source list and it'd be annotated you know this person great source this person bad source and now it's super easy uh you go online you google something you find somebody you can find somebody directly you can go on linkedin it's really easy to connect with somebody quickly if you need information now on the relationship between um a pr person and a journalist that's changed. And, and I'll be honest, I, I think it's changed, you know, for the worse. And, mm. and I'll tell you why. Like when I started, um, my first job was covering uh, real estate, which I knew nothing about. And this fella um, that is real estate securities, commercial mortgage backed securities and REITs. Uh, so super esoteric stuff for in, and not what you dream of covering when you want to be a journalist. There's no movie about the CMBS reporter that this you, you don't get Robert Refford playing you in that movie. But at the time there was a Japanese bank called Nomura securities. It was really big in this. And they had a PR guy uh, named PJ Johnson. And, you know, when I called him, I literally went 23 years old, went through my list, called it and people and PJ says, okay, tell me about you this. And he said, okay. 
um, I'm going to, you know, you, you're new at this. Uh, I want to build a relationship with you. You know, why don't we go to lunch and I'll bring uh, a couple of our key people and we'll just kind of walk you through how this thing works. And to this day, I, I talked to PJ um, a week or so ago when I was on a long drive and I, and I kept in touch with it. And there's so much more, you know, effort being put into cultivating those sources in a beneficial way. Not like, hey, you're my buddy. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a, you know, a chopped salad and throw in some guacamole and chips and you're going to say good things. It was more like, how do we develop that bond so we understand each other, knowing that at some point, every good journalist is going to write something bad about the PR person's client. And now um, I've, it's, it's gotten so impersonal. You can just send out a whole a blast email with all kinds of stuff. And particularly at the end of my time at the New York Times, you know, some people get lucky. They literally get lucky and they'd blast something out. And I was about to write a column on that in the next couple of weeks and it would work out. And then some people got really unlucky because they hadn't cultivated a source and I'd write a column. And on, on Monday or Tuesday, they'd send me an email saying, oh, next time you write about, you know, I don't know, private jets that only carry miniature schnauzers. Will you reach out to my client? I was like, chances are me writing another story about private jets that carry miniature schnauzers in this lifetime is very low. <laughs> um, but, and, and one of the things I'll say, and, and this is not because you've invited me on your your podcast, but, you know, Lance, this is the first time you and I met. I've known Jimmy forever. And there are only five PR people um, who I knew I could always you know, mm -hmm. countdown who I could go to uh, what one of them, you know, <laughs> what one Jimmy now works with one Jimmy used to work with <laughs> um, and, and, you know, two other, two other PR people. And, and that was it out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds yeah. of PR people. And why was that? Cause you know, Jimmy and I, you know, it took the time to, to get to know each other. And, yeah. and you know, if I call you up with a question, it's like, Hey, do you got somebody who does this? And, and you're like, yeah, let me see if I can find it. And then you'd always understand Sometimes that person would get quoted and they're great. And sometimes that person wouldn't get quoted because any number of reasons there, there wasn't enough space. They said the same thing as somebody else turned out to be really uninteresting, you know, like any number of things. And that didn't really, and, and surely on your end, you had to take flack if they weren't quoted, but then never change the relationship because it, it wasn't, it wasn't a transaction. Uh, it was a relationship. And, and that's the important thing to, to build the relationships, not have it be, you're, you're always going to lose when it's transactional. Absolutely. Alina, and, you're going to kill me, but I've got one more follow up. I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> because, well, well, think about what Paul was talking about even yeah. before. So you get this job at the Times, and I, I don't know if it was Lehman or Bear that collapsed first, but you're launching the Wealth Matters column right at the time where the great financial crisis is crumbling. You just mentioned uh, mortgage backed securities. Which oh, yeah. were involved in the in the great financial crisis, so like maybe that training could have helped you, but like talk about launching a a, a column which is for people of means that are focusing on generational wealth and the advisors that serve them, while the world is going to hell in a handbasket. So. Uh, one on that first part, it, it's like why I tell my kids they have to learn algebra because I bitched and moaned about writing about commercial mortgage-backed securities. And then when it came to structured products, tanking the entire economy, I was like, um, I actually understand how those work. Uh, I, could, I could help you out here. <laughs> um, and two, you're 100% correct because, um, you know, Robert, Frank and I, are, we're not we're not uh, best buddies or we're mortal enemies. We, we, we know each other socially and, and, and that's it. But, you know, when he started his column at the Wall Street Journal, um, when I was at the FT, it was all look at this. This guy just bought a 300 foot yacht or whatever. And 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 my take was always kind of different to his. It was, oh, my goodness, somebody bought a 300 foot yacht. How do you maintain a 300 foot yacht? How much does gas cost? How many people do you need? And that's how I kind of came into this this column at at the Times. And of course, um, at that point, um, nobody had 300 foot yachts or if they did. They were hiding them because the whole world is collapsing. So. I pivoted very quickly from a column that was conceived um, and sort of nurtured in a very frothy time to a column that became not the opposite, but tried to take uh, strategies that the the wealthiest among us, so the, the people who were surviving the financial crisis, take some of those strategies that they were empl employing and see if I could adapt them for the general reader of, of the New York times. And, and that's, you know, but, but that's, I mean, that's journalism 101. Like you think you're going to do something and I think you only have success as a journalist if, if you know how to pivot and, and think quickly on your feet. Absolutely. Awesome. 
Um, well, speaking of that, we would, from your time writing the Wealth Matters column for the New York Times, would love to hear maybe a few of the best lessons that you learned from speaking to wealth planning and investment management executives about you know their best practices. And like you were just saying, how you've translated some of those lessons for the rest of the world to understand as well. Uh, do not buy a 300 foot yacht ever <laughs> uh, <clears throat> under no let me just cross that off my list cross, really quick over here <laughs> make make friends with people who own uh 300 foot yachts but do not uh do. the best lessons were always on the way people thought about money and you know again as i said at the beginning i have a degree from the university of chicago but but no economics training whatsoever i really became enamored of and learned a lot about behavioral finance which is you know the way that people actually make economic decisions in real time, not the way economists would like us to make economic decisions, but how we actually made them. And, and some of the best people out there in the the wealth management, the wealth advisory world, uh, some, of the, some of the wealthiest people I knew, they thought about money and finance in those sort of behavioral buckets. And so what, what, what does that mean? You, you don't think like, okay, uh, I have a thousand dollars or I have uh ten million dollars or I have a billion dollars. You know, you think about like, okay, what are the buckets that I need to fund for my life? How do I break this down and mm -hmm. and make it simple? You know, what's the bucket for my rent or my mortgage? What's the bucket for uh fun? What's the bucket for uh my children for, for for them now? What's the bucket for them later if they're gonna go off to college? You know, what what's the reserve bucket I need? And that way of breaking money down and making it tangible was important then, but I think it's becoming even more important because it, it, in my town, I live in New Canaan, Connecticut, in my town for years and years and years, the local coffee shop, not a Starbucks, but the local like coffee shop where people would go, they only accepted cash. And so that was the only, I, I would have to go like every three weeks maybe and go to the ATM and get cash because that's the only thing I paid cash for. And it, it kind of really would like drip down three or $4 at a time every time I went in there. And now they've moved for whatever reason to accepting credit cards. And so now everybody pays with a credit card. And I have to be more conscious of cash because if I'm going somewhere where I have to actually pay cash, maybe I have $200 in my, my pocket. Maybe I have $2 in my pocket. But as a, as a dad, as, as somebody with, with three girls um, who are six, 11 and 14, to teach them about money, to teach them about finance, I have to make it tangible in their heads because they're not you know, they're not getting their allowance uh, as a pile of $1 bills. Um, they're, they're getting their allowance, you know, transmitted to them. They're not watching my mm. wife and me going into the store and putting down $20 bills to pay for our groceries. I mean, the store in our town, we don't even use a, a credit card because they have a house charge because it's a small town. And so you, you just get a bill at the end of the month. And so if, if we don't have those more tangible conversations with them, they, they won't get a good sense of money. But that's something that I saw uh, at my time at, at, at the New York Times, the, the wealthiest people thought in those terms. And that that could be a billionaire because you could be thinking, OK, uh, and I'm not saying this for, for jokes, but, but seriously, like a billionaire is going to have a lot of houses and a billionaire is going to have a, a jet because if there's one thing I would ever buy if I became a billionaire, it would be a jet because they're just better. But, you know, they also have faster than the 300 foot yacht for sure. So much better. than the, I would never buy the 300 foot yacht. I would buy the jet. I would 100 percent buy that. But then they have a foundation. They have philanthropic obligations. They have private investments they want to make. And the numbers are so large that if they thought, oh, God, I got $97 million over here. Or, oh, I have not. No, they think in terms of buckets and whether those buckets are full. And oftentimes the philanthropic part is is the part that's left over. You're like, oh, I have a billion dollars. Well, it turns out I only need $500 million to, to live because, uh, you know, planes don't fuel themselves. Uh, and I can take the other 500 million, put it in. but that's all about behavioral economics. And it's not thinking so much in dollars and cents. It's just making it more conceptual. Your supermarket bills you at the end of the month. They trust me, Jimmy. It's a trust relationship up here in Connecticut. It's not, you know, you, you, you slick Philadelphia guys down there. They're like, oh, where are we? <laughs> they don't bill me. They have, they have my credit card. They have my credit Love card that. on file and they just, you know, charge it once a month. So. Love that is Jimmy's one takeaway from wow. all of the wow. excellent well, advice was also Paul thinking, just bestowed upon us. No, I was also thinking about, well, he obviously didn't learn that making coffee at home is the smarter choice than going and buying the $4 coffee every single day but um now jimmy wow. you have to know though i would go and buy my coffee at the zoom box coffee shop but it would be a pound of coffee would be 
$14.75 or a pound of fancy coffee would be $17.50. I needed to have my $20 bill for that. And then I needed to make sure I had some ones because you couldn't stiff the person who just, you know, ground your coffee for you. So, you know, yeah, okay. it wasn't all, all right. just a cup at a time. Well, Seriously. I unapologetically admit that I bought my $4 latte this morning and I don't feel bad about it at all. <laughs> well, I can take that and, and segue into my second book, The Thin Green Line, which is distinguished in two ways. One, the Wall Street Journal recently named it top five book uh, for Congrats. millennials about money. That was a couple of weeks ago. And two, wow. Jimmy makes a cameo in that book. Jimmy makes a cameo. Um, but the point, the why I'm segueing into this is I talk about um, too many personal finance books are uh, built around the sort of diet analogy that if I don't do this, I'll get that. And, you know, if, if you're on a diet and you don't eat carbs or uh, drink wine or, you know, have whatever, you have 17 glasses of water and broccoli every day, you will lose weight. You'll 100 percent lose weight. And then as soon as you say, Jesus Christ, I, I got to have some more carbs. This is miserable. You'll put all that weight back on. And and most personal finance books are structured the same way. They say don't have that four dollar, you know, latte like Atlanta did be the, you know, the cheapskate like Jimmy and, you know, sit there with your folders uh, at home and, 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 you know, spoon it out one at a time. But the point of the book, the whole concept of the book is what we really need is to make better choices. And, and the thing green line, uh, the image of it is the S and P 500 from 1982 to now. And, and it goes up. It's a lot higher now than it was in 82, but it's not a straight line. It goes, it dips and rises. And, and the people who are on the, the, the top of that, the, the right side of the thing green line are the people who, have the ability to make choices. So they may want to buy that $4, you know, latte every day. Um, and that's totally fine as long as they're making other choices in their life that equal it out. Cause you know, what Jimmy doesn't tell you is that he makes his coffee, uh, at home every day, but he drives, you know, a $300,000, uh, Ferrari, California around the mean streets <laughs> of Philadelphia. So you know, exactly. it's all about, it's all about making choices. Yes. I wish. And an abundance mentality, I would say. <laughs> um, well, speaking of what you just mentioned, we actually were a little curious about Jimmy Moak's cameo in your book, saying that he had a name straight out of a David Mame play. <laughs> we are curious, was that an insult or a compliment? It was a compliment. So, Jimmy... Uh... <laughs> This is one of the first time we met, and I remember meeting Jimmy uh, in a Columbus Circle in New York, and he introduced me to Joe Duran, who is a guy who started United Capital, who's a guy I have sort of endless buckets of admiration for because Joe really got um, getting people to think about finance, personal finance. Uh, in a different way. Well, you, you won't bore you with the whole story, but essentially he came up this essentially this card game called Honest Conversations. And it's uh, it's simple. Uh, and in its simplicity, it's brilliant because it gets both people uh, in a relationship on the same page so they know what, what matters. And you essentially play this card game where you whittle it down to five cards and then you show your five cards and then you see where you overlap and where you didn't. And so, no. So Jimmy, you know, look, when you write books, you, you get to take a little more license than you do writing a column for the New York Times. So that was 100% a compliment. And then Jimmy and I have, you know, stayed stayed pals ever since. He took it as a compliment either way. <laughs> the first time you, you covered Joe in the New York Times, um, you remember that story? Is that the one where his mom is in it? Yes. Yeah. So that ran while I was on my honeymoon with Carissa. We were in Jamaica, and um, when I got back, my day-to-day -day contact at United Capital had a uh, a beautiful bottle of champagne waiting for me as a uh, gesture of thanks from from him and Joe. And that bottle of champagne I saved even after the divorce from Carissa, and kept it as my own. And but she and I drank it together along with a couple of other people when the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl in 2017. Nice. So, wow. How about that? Delayed gratification. I, Beautiful. I put aside a $150 bottle of champagne for seven years. I probably should have just drank it and enjoyed it in the moment, but I don't know. I, I And I've never heard that story. There's a good I thing. There's a good story about the relationship that a journalist and a PR person uh, can, can build because like, Jimmy, you never shared that champagne with me. Like, Jimmy, you've never given me anything. And they, like the relationship is like pure <laughs> and on the up and up because what we exchange 
is information. What we exchange is uh, our ideas. And what I what I knew I could always count on Jimmy for is like, holy shit, Jimmy, I need to talk to three people who know about this in the next five hours. And Jimmy say, okay, I can do that. But that only comes when you have uh, like a trust relationship with with the person you're working with on the other side. Before we're kind of flipping up our show because this is all we're stealing a little bit from the play segment. But you did used to do that, and it was hilarious. You would you would yeah. say this is the story that I'm working on. I'm a couple of sources short. You better hurry up and get me what I need. And by the way, I told Jason Lahita the same thing. And Jason and I at the time were were competitors. Yeah. So now I'm like Christ. Now I got to drop everything that I'm doing. I got to get Paul a source. I know that Jason is working on it right now, and the clock is ticking. <laughs> I, I I was transparent, and, and I knew that competition inspires people. <laughs> hilarious i love hearing these stories about jason and jimmy before they were on the same team it's just such a great part of street creds history <laughs> um well let's pivot a little bit we've talked a lot paul about your career as a journalist but we also definitely want to hear about company of dads and your journey as a founder firstly as promised we want to give some clarity to our listeners as to what a lead dad is you're a lead dad yourself. So why did you decide to become one? And how is that motto became the philosophical underpinning of the company of dad's platform? Uh, you know, I'm a lead dad and, and Jimmy is a, a lead dad too. Uh, we define lead dad as uh, the go-to parent, uh, whether he works full-time, part-time, or devotes all of his time to his family. And in many cases, uh, supports a spouse in his or her career. And we say in many cases because I'm a, a married lead dad who works full time with, with three girls. I don't think I'm you know, giving it any way. Jimmy is a divorced lead dad with three daughters. But we know that 18 percent of fathers uh, in the United States are divorced, uh, widowed or otherwise single. Um, how I came up with it, you know, I was a lead dad for a good portion of my time at The New York Times in 2013. My wife, who uh works in asset management decided to start her own firm and she had this plan she was going to take three months to start the firm and she says I, I think I should tell my partner uh that this is my plan and I said I don't think you should tell your partner that this is your plan and she said what are you talking about you work the New York Times you can't lie I like I'm not lying and like if he asks you specifically are you going to leave in three months and start your firm you should tell him but short of that uh don't do that and, and she didn't listen to me and she went in and told him and gave the whole line like you know put our clients first and you know da, da, yada 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 and you know, he yesed her out the door. And then the next day she was shut off from uh, all the systems at, at her firm. And she said, um, you know, wh what are we going to do? And I said, well, I think you're going to start your firm today because while everybody dreams of one day being married to a New York Times columnist, um, <laughs> that comp compensation does not pay uh, the mortgage in Connecticut. That, that That's paid by the higher earner person who works in asset management. We laughed at that. And then she says, what are we going to do with the kids? And I said, I'll become the lead dad. Mm. Uh, and at the time she says, well, what does that mean? And I said, hell if I know, but I mean, I, I wrote a book called clutch. I mean, I, 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 I PR that thing to death. I mean, I gave talks in from Vegas to, 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 you know, midtown Manhattan and, and, and we laugh, but what it really meant is by that point in my career, I'd already written one book. I was working on a second book. I was what I call a medium deal, uh, at the New York times, which is the best thing you could be because a big deal, um, they're in the office all the time, uh, and a little deal. Uh, they're not only in the office all the time, but they're also being called when they're not in the office to make sure they don't screw anything up. But a medium deal, I would essentially just, they, they could trust me, I could do this. And I started working much more uh, in, in what is now called uh, a hybrid mode, but we didn't really call it back then in 2013. But I would work you know, three days a week from home, uh, go into the city on Thursday and Friday. And my dad was younger at the time. He'd come down and help out with the kids. And I just got on with it. And, and one of the benefits was like when you work for the New York Times, you can call up guys like Jimmy and say, Jimmy, get me three sources right now. Lahita's already gotten me two. Uh, and, and it'll help you out. Uh, but then if you say to someone, hey, can you talk to me at like, you know, 145 on a Tuesday? Chances are they'll say, sure. Uh, and, and she, I could really, I never abused it, but you could control your schedule. And that was the key. I had control over my schedule. But at the same time, I wasn't walking around New Canaan. I didn't go into the New York Times or, or get on the train and say, Paul Sullivan, you know, lead dad. I said, Paul Sullivan, you know, New York Times columnist. I mean, to be honest, that that's a, you know, when you, when you have that role, it becomes part of your identity. You know, it's something I'd always aspire to. So it was definitely part of my identity, but we get to COVID, we get to, you know, March and April of, of 2020, you know, I'm super busy. Um, because big story, uh, on the business desk. My wife is super busy because she's worried what's going to happen to my firm that I've been building over the past 
you know, seven years, is this going to be 2008 all over again? You know, nobody mm-hmm. really imagines what actually happened would, would happen. And then we had three daughters at this point. We had three daughters who were all trying to do Zoom school, which was a disaster because, you know, of three, three girls in three different schools, three different age groups, and, mm-hmm. and only one of the schools really got it right. And, and the one who was on the cusp of turning three, like, what you know, what the preschool isn't going to get this right. And so it, it became this moment of, this is kind of lonely. Like, I, I don't like, you know, I, I'd go in the city, I'd see people, I'd be, you know, you know, chatting all the time. I, I, I play a lot of golf, as you said in the intro, I'd, I'd go play golf and I didn't have anything. And so I said, there's got to be something for guys like me. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a, a stay at home dad, nothing wrong with that. That's not my thing. And uh, I'm not a dad who, you know, takes the, the train and flies off and, and leaves the parenting to uh, a spouse or a, a, a paid ca- caregiver. I'm, I'm something in between. And then I went, you know, to the Google, uh, as we all do, because Google knows everything. And uh, there's tons of stuff for moms. All the stuff that says parents um, is really for moms. Um, there's even this online magazine called Fatherly. A bunch of Condé Nast guys started it, pretty cool. But like 60 to 65% of the people who read Fatherly are moms. So I'm <laughs> like, oh, what's going on here? This is like father-ish. I don't even know what this thing's called. And all the stuff for dads was more like dads trying to figure something out. You know, there's one for divorced dads uh, or dads going through divorce. There was one for dads who drank too much, uh, drug problems. There was one for dads who had bad relationships with their kids. There were ones for like dads who just been incarcerated, like, all like super important and tactical, but not what I thought was needed. And yeah. then, you know, I followed a lot of these golf communities and I said, boy, there's all kinds of resources for people who just want to talk nonsense uh, about their hobbies. And I was part of that. I was talking nonsense, too. It's like there's got to be something more. So then I did what journalists do. I said, you know, how many people are the dads? How, how can I figure this out? Turns out that was, that was the easiest part because the U S census has all this data. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has it, the Pew has it. And we found out is a huge number. The 25 million men in America who are lead dads or could be lead dads. Now to put that in context, there's 75 million fathers and 125 million adult men overall. But it's still a big number. And, and and what did that group break down into? Well, 3 million uh, men call themselves stay-at-home dads. We call them lead dads who devote all the time to the family. Uh, 18%, as I said before, 18% of, of fathers in the United States are divorced, widowed, or otherwise single. And then the big number uh, that we could measure, and there's a fourth category we can't measure, but the big number that we could measure was the 46% of married heterosexual couples where the wife earned as much or more um, than her husband. And if there's one thing we saw in COVID was how people got really, really angry when they both were working hard and the parenting still fell to these traditional gender norms. Like, you know, mm-hmm. why is it, you know, nobody could, you couldn't lie anymore and say, I'm really, really busy. Like, you're not really busy. You're sitting there doing nothing, you know, at <laughs> three in the afternoon, you could help out. And then there's a fourth category, which we only kind of have anecdotally just from people who joined the company of dads and that's married gay dads. There's not really a, a way to gaze out. We assume that single gay dads fit in the, you know, the single category. And then after that, uh, I went and I talked to senior female executives because I knew men would not be honest with me because I wasn't honest. I wasn't going around to Kane. As I said, Paul Sullivan, lead dad. And I talked to these senior female executives, all kinds of industries. And what I found was there was a correlation. The women at the very, very top, you know, they had kids, very top, you know, senior law firm people, senior in consulting companies. They broke down to one of two categories. One, they had a husband who was uh, a lead dad and had been supportive of their career, whether he worked full-time, part-time or, or whatever, or they were divorced and something had happened, you know, on their ascent up the, the corporate lab and it didn't work out and he, the husband pulled his weight. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting data point. And then when I went to talk to people more in their thirties, twenties, thirties, forties, I saw like a lot of the women who were really striving and had kids, they either had a spouse who was already there being supportive or they said, geez, this is a really good idea. This lead dad thing, this is a good idea. Would you ever you know, like create a lead dad boot camp? You know, I love, I love my husband, I love my partner, but boy, if he knew, you know, what was going on, this would help. And the third component to that was at this time, and, and then I'll shut up at this time, um, the New York Times, it, it wasn't well known at the time. I don't even know how well known it is now, but the then executive editor was editing the paper from, Los Angeles. His kids were in college out there and he moved out to Los Angeles and was editing the New York Times. Now, I don't think the New York Times has ever been edited from any place other than New York City. Now, if the New York Times is being edited from Maplewood, New Jersey, where you know the majority of senior New York Times editors live, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. But it was in Los Angeles. And that was the the, the, the last bit of it was, you know what, if the New York Times can be edited from Los Angeles, 
we're just going to work differently. I mean, the, the newsroom closed for over a year. We're, we're going to work differently. And I knew from giving keynote talks that companies would screw this up. They would screw it up badly. Even the companies that really wanted to get it right, even the companies that really cared about their employees, they wanted to figure this out, they would be stuck with you know confirmation bias. I became senior at XYZ firm by doing this. You should do the same thing. Well, COVID was that reset. COVID changed everything. And so one of the things I benefited from was giving these 100 keynote talks. I knew that they needed somebody to come in and you know, I didn't have all the answers, but I had all the questions and to ask those questions and get people thinking in a productive way. So those, the, the, the more junior employees in their twenties and thirties would one day take over the firm or could be on equal footing with those more senior employees in their fifties and sixties. And, and so, you know, fast forward October 21, my final column ran in the times, uh, and it wasn't a wealth matters column. It was a, a column on page two of the paper, um, that talked about why I was leaving and what I was going to do next. It was an incredible gift um, that the editors of the Times gave me. And I, I got flooded by emails from from the mm. three groups that I hope would, would email me. And that was men suddenly calling themselves lead dads, working moms cheering me on and or uh, asking for me to create lead dad boot camps. Um, and then people in the broader HR space at companies saying, hey, how can you help us? And so we launched mm. in, in February 22 and we do three things. We do media, community and workplace consulting. What a wow. beautiful origin story. When you wrote that story for page two, anyone come after you very angry or were there yeah. any uh, edits that were missed? Any typos? Uh, well, and, and there, there are no typos in that because it was <laughs> short. That. Okay. It, it was only like 800 words and I read it over uh, 40 times. But the group that did come after me were um, women who called themselves stay-at-home moms. And they said, uh, why do you get to call yourself a lead dad. And I said, hmm. you know, you can call yourself whatever the hell you want. Like, I'm not starting the company of moms. I'm starting the company of dad. So like, I think stay at home mom is a stupid <laughs> title. Call yourself a lead mom for all I care. Like, that's why we don't call the men who devote all their time to their family. We don't call them stay at home dads. We just don't use that term. We call them hmm. lead dads who devote all their time to their family. And, and I, and I said, not in a sarcastic way, but in an encouraging way, like, you know, women who get labeled stay at home moms, they're not staying at home. They're out and about with their kids. They're organizing the house. They're managing things. And this is, and they're helping their spouse do whatever he does in, in his career. So they should embrace a more progressive term, a more inclusive term, a term that actually describes right. uh, what they did. But, but I, you know, and occasionally I still get blowback on that, but, you know, I've got a, an answer ready at this point. Well, that's sort of why I asked the question about the terminology too, because I love it. I think it's really empowering and an important reframing and language has so much power. Yeah. I mean, you can embrace it. And this is, you know, we've got, you know, Jimmy's a, a, an Eagles fan and, uh, you know, this, this guy on my advisory board, a guy named Najee Good won a Super Bowl for the Eagles in, in 2017. Really great guy, become a friend of mine. But when I talked to his buddies, his retired NFL player buddies, they like the term yeah. because it's powerful is progressive. It gives them something to latch onto. And, and they don't have to, you know, they don't want to call themselves a house husband. They don't want to call themselves Mr. Mom. And they like this idea of lead dad. And think about it. These are the most masculine men in America. And also 93 of the top hundred shows last year were all NFL games. Like if these guys embrace this term, this is powerful for your average guy. Who's wondering like, am I a lead dad? Am I not a lead dad? You know, yeah. You see the guy who who sacked, you know, Tom Brady, which Najee did, uh, calling himself a lead dad. That's that's pretty good. Awesome. Thank you the so first. much for that, Paul. Okay. I think we're ready to hit our next and last segment and play pseudo rapid fire. Our first question for you, Paul, is a bit of a two parter. Firstly, who is the better PR guy, Jimmy or Jason? And oh secondly, God. who do you think is the better golfer? <laughs> that's like picking you know between like superman and lex luther i don't even know but I, I, i'm picking jimmy hands <laughs> down i'm picking jimmy because you know if you have you ever seen jason in person he's got the hair he's got the the deep baritone voice he's he's got the tan it's just too much like jimmy <laughs> all the way jimmy all the way uh and, and that's not just because he's the one sitting in front of you right now not at all <laughs> no, if jason was here I, i'd say it right to his face and he's gonna listen to this so i know that uh, and then who is the better golfer? I'm going to say that, you know, Jimmy is a guy having a couple beers. He's cracking jokes. He's competitive. He's winning a couple holes. And Jason, Jason's going to have like the most beautiful outfit you've ever seen. It's going to be like press pants, brand new shoes, uncreased hat. I don't even know if he'll even hit the ball. He'll just walk and, and, and look great. But, but, you know, if I want a partner, I, I'm also going with Jimmy on that one too. Wow. Oh, two for two, right. Jimmy. We're going to so, have to uh, console Jason after he listens to this episode. <laughs> yeah. 
I joke with Jason and, uh, and and one of my industry friends that I think both of us could probably be described as scratch dressers, but probably <laughs> not scratch golfers. Uh, Jason does golf a lot more than I do. So you got that one wrong. But the first question, the more important one. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. If it weren't journalism and being a founder, what would you be doing, Paul? If I was had been any good at biology or science in high school and or college, I would be a doctor. I'd be uh, like a, a general practitioner. I, I think they have the coolest job out there because they're just there to help people and they know all kinds of different stuff. And they say, any special, that's what I would love to do. And I love every year when I go for my annual physical talking to my GP because he's just such a knowledgeable guy. Love it. Awesome. Okay. Besides golf, which we know, what else do you do for fun? Uh, well, I, you know, I do a lot of stuff with my my girls, and one of the things I've done with them, uh, I have three girls. I've tried to have an activity that I only do with that one, so that we can go and mm. and have fun. And so, and it, I don't exclude the other ones, but like generally, like my oldest daughter, she and I ski and play tennis together. Although I'm horrible at tennis, she just, you know, laughs at me. My middle daughter, um, she likes playing paddle tennis, which is a kind of weird New Englandy sport in the winter. Uh, we do that together. And then she likes me to just sit and read with her. Uh, and then my youngest daughter, she, she actually plays golf. She's been playing golf with me since she was 15 months old. And of course, you know, all three of them, what do they like to do? And they like to go in the swimming pool with dad and, and the youngest one, you know, she likes, I can, I can still throw her. Uh, so she likes that a lot too. I love the so focus we, on all the sports and activity. That's awesome. Well, you know, I think probably, sorry, Jim, but sorry, like as a, as a, a journalist now, as a founder, like so much of my life is spent at a desk or inside mm-hmm. and so much of my life is cerebral uh, that, you know, I just love the chance to get outside and, and do something with them. And it doesn't even matter, you know, kind of whatever they want to do, I'm, I'm up for. You're preaching to the choir, big get outside <laughs> girl over here. <laughs> what is the difference between paddle ball and pickleball? Uh, paddle is dignified. Pickle is ruining America. I I thought that Connecticut was like, (laughs) uh, uh, you know, ground zero for pickleball. Isn't that like where it really started to catch on during the the pandemic? I have a friend who lives, I think, two towns over from you. And he was he would always be showing me pictures about how his neighborhood would organize games on his on his driveway. And this was like back in 20, you know, 2020. And he said, it, everybody in Connecticut is playing. That's not true. They're playing and and, and it's disheartening, you know, and I'll tell you this huh. story. When I, at the times I, I interviewed uh, Mike Melden, who is a discovery land and he's the other part of Casamigos. You know, there's sort of three amigos in Casamigos tequila. There was George Clooney, wildly handsome guy. And then Randy Gerber, uh, married to Cindy Crawford, also equally handsome guy. And they had developing these discovery land properties. They started putting pickleboard pickleball in them and i said mike what, what are you doing like t- t- tell me the truth here like george clooney doesn't play pickleball does he? he's such an undignified sport of like you know going all around he's like oh no george loves pickleball i'm like oh my <laughs> god i can't bit this is like a disease on america paddle is played in the winter and it's cold pickle is played in the summer and old people injure themselves because they they try to do too much and they get hurt so i do not play pickleball Got an it. important distinction Um, All right, Paul, this is our final question. We like to close the show with a moment of gratitude. Just give you the opportunity to shout out someone in the industry you admire or someone on your team, someone in your life who might be listening. Go for it. Uh, I don't want this to be cliche, but my gratitude goes to my wife because, you know, she has backed this idea of of the company Dash for the first year. Um, we, we invested our own money in there and, and she was the one who said, I'm not letting you write another book. Uh, this is bigger than a book and you've had a great run at the New York times. You've got to take a risk and, and do this. And I am a risk averse guy. I never would have done this without my wife's backing. So I'm very grateful, uh, to her for, for believing in this. And, and she talks it up with, with all of her colleagues who are, who are working moms in, in finance. And so all my gratitude goes to her. Beautiful. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. To our listeners, we really hope that you learned something new and enjoyed hearing Paul's story. Thank you so much for being on the show. And to everyone who listened in today, be sure to write us via email at pressplay at streetcredpr.com to tell us what you think. 
ask us any questions, suggest any guests, or even just to tell us what you had for lunch today. Thanks again for tuning in, and we cannot wait to introduce you to our next guest. Thank you for listening to Press Play, the Street Cred Podcast. Visit our website at streetcredpr.com and find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Please don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. And if you enjoyed the episode, we'd love nothing more than if you would rate and review the show. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Street Cred PR. The content has been made available for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you have questions about the show or Street Cred PR, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks again for listening. Yeah.